research company based in Belgium. And as you can see, he's going to be talking about an open source software for land cover mapping. So I'll hand over to Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being so patient. I, I hope I can uh, fulfill the expectations, which must be very high by now, uh, waiting so long. <coughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about open source uh, software for land cover mapping um, based on remote sensing data. This is the, the outline of my talk. Um, I'll give a, a brief background on, on, on software for remote sensing. Uh, then we'll jump into a case study, uh, which I use uh, to show uh, how, how this uh, software was used and uh, I'll give the methods and uh, some results uh, before I conclude. So first, some background. Uh, for image processing, uh, for remote sensing applications, it, that, that has been previously reserved for really the commercial packages. As we know, for example, Envy, Eras, Imaging, Ecognition, um, some, some others. And uh, luckily, there has been uh, a counterpart for the, uh, the open source, starting, of course, with the well-known uh, GDAL OGR tools uh, with their API. Uh, not all uh, researchers, because uh, this is um, in the research environment where I'm from, uh, many people are using uh, still the commercial packages because they're not so either capable or interested or they don't have the time to use the API to, to really um, uh, implement uh, the algorithms that are needed, uh, for example, uh, the machine learning techniques. Uh, and for that, uh, there are some, some other packages like, we all know, GRASS, uh, the GIS software suit. Um, there's uh, a bit more recently, uh, there's a, a very nice package of the CNES um, um, space agency in, in France, the Orfeo toolbox, and the next uh, speaker will talk all about, uh, all about that. It's, um, it's quite a large package with an API development uh, environment, command line interface, and, and a GUI. Uh, the package I'm talking about uh, now in, in this uh, speech is, is uh, PK Tools. I started to work on that um, on, on my PhD um, quite some years ago, and I decided to, to release it as an open source. It's, it's much more uh, humble than, than the Orfeo toolbox, and it's uh, only a command line interface. But I, I want to show what's, what's possible with it. Um, the case to the study, it's, um, it's the data fusion contest of the <coughs> IEEE. Uh, every year, the, the IEEE uh, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society is, is issuing uh, a contest. And the contest is always about data fusion. And, and mostly, uh, you have to classify automatically an image. And this year, in 2013, there was a hyperspectral image acquired over Houston or the Houston urban area uh, together. So it had to be data fused, let's say, with a, a digital surface model um, acquired with a LiDAR sensor. And those of you who are not familiar with hyperspectral uh, images, uh, those are a, a special kind of, of uh, digital cameras, let's say, or sensors that are acquiring data in, in, a, in a large number of spectral bands. So instead of having like three uh, RG, an RGB camera with only three bands in the visual uh, spectrum. It has, like for example, the KC, the CASI sensor has 144 very narrow spectral bands, a lot of information to deal with. Uh, the spatial resolution uh, was two and a half, two and a half uh, meters per, per pixel, and that was also the case for the, the digital surface model. The digital surface model gives you height <laughs> information. So in in combination with the hyperspectral data, you have a lot of information, uh, not only on the spectral side, but also on the height. So that was acquired <laughs> with LiDAR, a laser-based sensor. It was only one band of information, which is the height, and it has been acquired in the same spatial resolution, and the images were already co-registered. That, that was already uh, helpful. The contest consisted in an automatic classification of 15 classes, which you see over here. Um, I'll go a bit into more detail in the classes uh, in a minute um, when I will talk about the challenges. The challenges, of course, there are some challenges, otherwise it wouldn't be a contest. Uh, first of all, there was a data fusion. You had to find the best way to combine 
the, the two data sets, the LiDAR information of height and the spectral information, in order to obtain an optimal classification, so the, the best classification results. Uh, one of the challenges was the similarity of the classes. Some of the classes were very clear, near to each other. Uh, there was also a, a cloud shadow cast on <coughs> one part of the image, which uh, turned out to be quite a, a difficult uh, thing, and I, I, I didn't solve it, actually, so I, I, I already say that uh, now. Um, it had to be automatic, so it had to be an automatic classification, no uh, visual interpretation involved. And the extra challenge I put here is um, I was interested in how can we solve it only using only uh, open source tools. So a bit more on the similarity <coughs> of the classes. You see the classes legend over here. As you see, there are three classes uh, for grass. Uh, the grass, there is healthy grass, stressed grass, and synthetic grass. So the synthetic grass was for, for a sports field. Uh, you had In the sports field, you had the middle part, which was uh, where people run uh, quite often uh, into that this is this was a stressed grass, so uh, the no, the non-healthy grass, let's say, and the uh, the, gra the healthy grass. And from the visual eye, it's very difficult to distinguish those. Luckily, we had a hyperspectral uh, data, um, which is very capable of dealing with those subtle differences in classes. Uh, then. Uh, one of the challenges it turned out to be much more difficult than the similar classes uh, of the land cover which was that some of those classes uh, were mixed uh, land cover and land use. Land cover is typically uh, related to remote sensing because there are two different types uh, on the ground. The, the problem is uh, when you have land use, the, the classes can be very similar can be the same actually from the texture from 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 the from the material itself but it's just how we use them as an example residential and commercial areas for remote sensing application it's actually the same uh, the same with roads and highway they're built out the same uh, material uh, but it's just how we use it, it that the classes differ and then finally for the parking lots there were two types of parking one was the free parking and the other was t the taken part uh, parking lots uh, this is, uh, it's very difficult to see here, I'm sorry for, the, uh, for that, but there was a huge uh, cloud shadow, so there a, sh a cloud was hanging over <laughs> here, and it cast a shadow all in this area, which is very difficult for an automatic classification, but that's act because actually you want to classify, or the computer to classify uh, this building, if it's, it's another building in commercial area here, it has to be classified in the same class, but from the, from the spectrum, it's totally different because of the cloud shadow. Okay, then uh, about the methods, it's, uh, it's about a, classi uh, a supervised classification, which, means, which is a machine learning method, <coughs> which means that you have a, a number of uh, labeled pixels which were provided by the, the committee, of the organizing committee, and it enables us or the computer to learn how to classify <coughs> unseen data. So there's a subset which is provided as a training set. And um, the approach uh, I was using is uh, open source tools only, heavily based on GDAL and OGR, and on this PK tools, uh, which is built on, on top of that for um, remote sensing applications and, and the machine learning. And I would like to invite you to, if you're interested, uh, you can uh, run the entire uh, method uh, I will present uh, now. Um, you can download the data, you can download uh, the training set, uh, and also the tools. Uh, I, I generated everything in a script, and I tried to explain it in a wiki page. So if you're interested, you can just run through it and, and do it for yourselves. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the tools are, they have been uh, released uh, in GPL3. Uh, you can download them. There's a Git uh, in Savannah. It's based on GDL OGR. Uh, for some, it might be a, a curse, but for me, it's a blessing. Uh, it's only command line driven, uh, just as the GDL tools are. Uh, currently, it's only on Linux. Uh, it's in the in the stack or in, on the to-do list to uh, to release them for Windows, but um, it's not it's not yet there. So. 
So on the top row, you see the data that was provided by the organizing committee. There is the LiDAR data, there is the CASI hyperspectral data, and there was this training sample. And the training sample was just an, a plain a CSV file with, for each row, an ID number, the longitude and latitude where you can define the pixel and then the class it belongs to. And based on that, that was the training set. <coughs> so the first program I used uh, was uh, a conversion of that ASCII file to a vector file. And I used the OGR uh, library for that. So I converted it in a vector file and overlaid that vector on the hyperspectral image in order to extract the values that were below those uh, training sample. And when I subtract them, I, or extracted them, I created a new uh, vector file with as attributes the actual content, uh, the values <coughs> of the pixels. And so that <coughs> I, became, uh, I obtained a vector file containing all information I needed <coughs> to do the actual training for the classifier. To give you an idea of how a hyperspectral uh, signal uh, looks like, I give you an example here of the, of the grass spectra. So there are the, green, uh, the three uh, grass spectra, the healthy grass in green, the stressed grass in orange, and then the synthetic grass here. Uh, what you see here, this is the spectrum, the, the electromagnetic spectrum from the visual part uh, all the way up to the near infrared. And what you see here, quite interesting, so this, um, for example, for the healthy grass, the middle line here is the average spectrum. And then I also show uh, the, the, uh, the standard deviation uh, for the different pixels of that particular class. And what you see here, this is the visual part uh, in, in, in blue, green, and red. If you only see what you see with your eyes, it's very difficult to distinguish because all the classes are o overlapping. What you see with a hyperspectral sensor is that you'll, you'll all, you have all these bands here, and luckily, and you see that it's quite easy to distinguish uh, those classes here. So yeah, again, uh, maybe on, on the online data, it's, it's much more I easy to see there. But for example, the synthetic grass and a normal glass, uh, grass, it's very difficult for, for us to see the difference. But here, you see immediately there's a huge difference in the, in the near infrared. Uh, the same uh, for, the, for the building there, which was even more difficult because as it, it's here we're talking about <coughs> land use difference. Um, the houses that were built uh, or that were constructed for the housing, for the, for the residential area, they are much like the, 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 the buildings that are used for commercial area. And you see, especially in this commercial area, there's a huge variation and there's a lot of overlap uh, with the residential areas. Um, even worse for the roads, as I mentioned, you have roads and highway, they're exactly the same, and so there's a complete overlap there for the, for the training pixels in, in, in those classes. Uh, again, the parking lots, a total overlap. Um, there's another step, I won't go into too much detail, but in, in hyperspectral, the, one of the problems in hyperspectral uh, imagery is that you have a lot of uh, dim uh, high dimensionality, and in machine learning, this is known as a curse of dimensionality. Uh, if your dimension is too high with respect to the number of training pixels you have, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, an ill-posed problem, and you will not be able <coughs> to solve it. So it's there's a, a, a feature selection that involved where you only concentrate on the, on the best features. And you see that from a number of 16 uh, spectral features, the classification was not improving. Oh. Uh, then once we, we got the selected features from the hyperspectral image, it was time to fuse the data with the LiDAR image. And in this case, we just did a future, uh, feature fusion where we concatenated the sec 16 spectral bands with the height information, treated as one image, and extracted that information uh, as input for the classifier. Now, um, you see that it's already better. For example, in the resi residential and commercial area, there's a total overlap almost here. Um, there is still some overlap. This is the height information for the same classes, residential and commercial. But you see that most of 
the majority of the house of houses in the residential area are until 20, 25 <coughs> meters, whereas uh, height, whereas the commercial area starts from, from 20 meters. So they're just a bit higher, and you can use that information for your classifier. So combined, uh, combining these two information, you hope that the classes get distinguished better. So then the actual uh, classification, you use both imagery, you, put it, you, you make a, a training sample by extracting, by overlaying the vectors on those imagery, you train the classifier, and then you feed the classifier also with the actual imagery, and you obtain the final classification output. There was one final step, uh, which is a mark of random field filtering, which is also part of the, of the filtering uh, process in, in, in the tools. Uh, this is a filter uh, that uses contextual spatial information in order to get rid of the, the salt and pepper effect you typically have in this um, raster-based, uh, pixel-based classification. So there's a lot of small uh, pixelation uh, effect, and with a a mark of random field filter, you are able to clump uh, some of the classes together in order to get rid of those. And you see when I switch back and forth, you see that some of this uh, effect has been removed. So um, typically, we are more interested in a more homogeneous uh, uh, result. And, and that's what this uh, filter was used for. OK, finally, then some, uh, some results. Um, the obtained overall accuracy was 83%, which is not a bad result if you see that w there were 15 classes at the end. Um, there was also quite some similarity, also the land use. It's, it's quite a difficult, a challenging problem. However, if you look at the winning solution, uh, that was uh, much better classified. So it was 94% uh, accurate. accurate. If you see, if you look in more detail, where actually the differences are, in this area, most, let, let's say not all, but it, it, it's quite similar. Where the differences are mostly is in this area. Remember this, uh, we had this cloud shadow. So I, I did not solve um, the cloud shadow part. So all this is, this is a bit rubbish. Let's say you see some, some water over here, some, uh, uh, some roads that shouldn't be roads, and this is because it's it's just all dark, uh, a dark spectrum. And what the the winning solution did here was uh, it was some kind of a um, uh, it was to to deal with this um, cloud shadow, and it would take uh, me too far uh, to to try to solve it with a generic. Uh, open source tools. So there's no real generic tool that can do this, neither in, in, in any of the, the commercial software packages. So if you see how they solve it, um, it's, it's very ad hoc, very uh, dedicated to how they, they solve it. And, and it's just not possible with a plain um, uh, open source solution that is ready uh, for use. If we go, for example, to the 10th uh, place of, of the, the, there were only 10 places published. And so you see here, it's already much closer because if you see the, the, the tenth place, they did not solve this problem either, you see here. So it had a bit of a, the same problems I had in, in my classification there. And you see there that it's very close. And also the, th the 83, it's also much more closer to the, to the 86, which explains that, that most of the difference. If you, had, if you wanted to win, it was there that you had to concentrate on. To conclude, um, so we have seen um, this, was a, this was a contest, which is there every year from the IEEE. So it's quite a, a challenging land cover. There are much more easy land cover uh, problems. Um, there was hyperspectral data involved. So as I mentioned, there is a curse of dimensionality. It has 140 spectral bands. You have to deal with those. There was then also the data fusion. You had to deal with the LiDAR data combined with the hyperspectral data. Um, there was a cloud shadow. Um, I show, I've shown that it can be solved uh, with uh, readily available uh, open source tools. Um, the result was not among the top 10, but close. Uh, it's, uh, for the moment, it's only command line driven, no clicks. Uh, everything which, for me, it's, it's, it's really nice because 
you can put it in a single script. I can execute it uh, in, 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 in less than a minute. Everything is, is, is done. If I want to change or tweak some, some things, you can just adapt uh, the, the script file uh, without any clicking uh, involved. Uh, and if you're interested, you can do the same and uh, just download uh, the available files. That's all. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> We've got a little time. Questions, if anybody has a question for Peter. Hello. Big <laughs> Sarah, hear me? I don't like my phone. Uh, very interesting, very, very interesting. So sort of two questions was, is one is, did you look at any other classifiers besides SVN, like Random Forest? And my second question is, uh, did you look at, did you consider bringing in uh, uh, the spatial component of dealing with you know topology shape, looking at say, I don't know if you've, if you've seen GeoDMA that implements uh, some sort of like e-cognition. Did you look at that at all? Uh, yes, that's a, a good question. First of all, for the classifiers, um, for the moment, um, I have implemented another one with a, a neural network, artificial neural network. I did not use it here. Um, actually, because the, the support vector machine which I used here is is um, it's well known for dealing well with the, the, the high dimensionality. In it's it's loved, uh, It's often used in um, in hyperspectral uh, remote sensing, and this is the reason why I use it here. Um, I'm not sure if it would change that much by cho choosing another classifier. My experience in classifiers is that it's much more how you deal with this, with the training data, how you do the the, the feature selection, um, try to put in some other features. This is. Mostly, if, if you're, we're talking about good classifiers already, uh, and, 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 and random forest and, and, all, and the others, they're, they're equally good classifiers. My experience is that the, the difference is rather in, in a, you have to search in another area, like, for example, trying to deal with the, the cloud shadow. That would be the first thing to, to concentrate on. The second part um, is also quite interesting. Is um, There are, apart from the spectral, and the, and, the, and the height information, there's a lot of other information, spatial context. Uh, I've used it with the random uh, um, a mark of random field. Uh, there it's, it was used in, in, in some sense. I've played a bit with some texture uh, parameters, especially trying to deal with the roads and the, um, and the highways, trying to deal with, I mean, there's more homogeneity in the highways than in the roads, which are more narrow. Um, the, the conclusion was that it didn't make that much of a difference, or I had to spend more time in it, that it was also possible. So I was not able to, I, I was maybe <coughs> able to do a one or two percentage increase. But then for me, it was more, for the case study, it was more interesting to have a, a quite simple solution, which was easy to follow and, and could just concentrate on, on, on one package and then. Just because I wonder what the blue from the pixels and the actual object, you start dealing with objects, and you start seeing, you know, the Yes, yeah, I, I'm sure that there are some, 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 some clever solutions you can use for that, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, is it a simple question? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, um, the, the classification technique you used in this particular project, is it similar to the typical, um, 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 uh, typical plan shuffling technique you use in remote sensing? S sorry, I didn't, I didn't. The data fusion technique yes. used within the hyperspectral uh, image, yes. the LiDAR image, is it similar to the, I mean, uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's a different thing. The pen sharpening tries to create uh, one image um, by, in, typically you have uh, um, uh, a, cr a panchromatic <coughs> image without spectral information on a high resolution, and you try to put in some spectral information within that to have the best of both worlds. Uh, here, it was the same, it, it was a different technique. You had the spectral bands, and you have the uh, the height information, and I just created one image, concatenated the several bands, having one extra band, let's say, as a layer for the height, and use that for the classifier. So I did not create a new image uh, for the band sharpening, which is, in my experience, mostly useful for visual interpretation and not so much for classification. Right. Thank you very much.
Peter, not only for a really interesting talk, but being almost exactly on 20 minutes, which as we're fast approaching, lunch is, is pretty vital. Okay, here. thank you. Only two seconds off, the best so far I've seen <laughs> in two 